and to introduce the Tyndall Bible and to introduce William Tyndall uh, personally, we have to understand, first of all, uh, again, we, we talked about the political context last week with the different kings of England, and now we want to talk about the, the, the language. We want to talk specifically about Latin. And it is impossible to understand the Tyndall Bible without understanding the, the uh, Latin underpinnings of the church at that time. The Roman Catholic Church was thoroughly committed to the Latin version of the Bible, which was in, in we, we commonly refer to it as the Latin Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate was created by uh, Jerome uh, about 382, so a fourth century production. And it's interesting when Jerome created the Vulgate, he was assigned to do it, and, and he was basically assigned to take the various manuscripts and uh, Latin manuscripts of the Old and New Testament and kind of put them together and make a standard set for the church. Well, what Jerome did, and is and, and we're going to see this, it's a, it's a fascinating um, repeat of history because Jerome is going to have an assignment to do something and he does something else entirely. And we're going to see that at the end of this story with the King James Bible because the King James translators, remember, are going to be given as an assignment. The assignment is basically to update the Bishop's Bible and they are going to completely abandon that project and come up with something brand new, the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, uh, Jerome kind of starts this as, as, a, as a trend and, and he begins the work. He realizes he really doesn't want to simply pull together a bunch of disparate manuscripts and try to standardize the text. He decides what is needed is a translation of the Greek, of the Hebrew, into Latin to make a standard Latin translation for the church. And that's what he works on and uh, completes at about 382. Um, Jerome's work, again, was scandalous at a certain level because the church by Jerome's time was fairly anti-Semitic. And, and anti-Semitic, they were, they were uh, um, not only anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic, they were trying to completely separate uh, Christianity as it existed in his time, They're trying to separate Christianity, trying to separate the church, separate everything that they had at that moment from its Jewish roots. We talk in, in theology about continuity and discontinuity. Well, the, the church was completely discontinuous. They wanted uh, um, the church essentially, they wanted Christianity essentially to forget that it had any connection to Judaism whatsoever. And so when uh, Jerome was going to translate the Old Testament, it was expected that he would simply translate the Greek Septuagint into Latin. The Septuagint was the accepted Old Testament text. Um, Jerome scandalized and in, in, at a certain level put himself in danger because he went to Jewish rabbis, to Jewish scholars, to those familiar with the, the, the Hebrew text, learned Hebrew, involved some of them in the process of translating the Hebrew texts and manuscripts that were available at that time into Latin. So the, the, the strength of Jerome was the, the fact that he not only translated the, the New Testament Greek into Latin, but he actually translated the Hebrew text into Latin, which is, which is important. And Jerome's Vulgate then becomes the standard Latin Bible, the standard Bible of the church, of Christianity, period, going forward um, until the time of the Reformation and even beyond. Um, it, the Latin Vulgate remains essentially the text of the Roman Catholic Church that they use almost in a de facto basis until the, until the English Reformation. And you have to understand, too, that Latin 
is the language of scholarship then by the time we get to the Middle Ages. It is, if, if you are literate, you might be literate in your local language, which might be, you know, English or French or German or whatever. But in terms of scholarship, in terms of learning, in terms of the academy, in terms of all things Christian, it was done in Latin. Jerome's Vulgate, interestingly enough, has another parallel to uh, the King James Version and, and a phenomenon that we see in today's church, which we commonly refer to as King James Onlyism. The, the King James Only phenomena, and there, there are those who believe that the King James Version of the Bible is the only English version. It is the only proper uh, uh, version of the English Bible that should be used in the church. It is, uh, um, it is no longer in some circles even considered a translation of the Greek and Hebrew. It is considered that, that, the, that the translators in the, King, in the King James Translation Committee were in fact inspired by God. That, that, that if you get to a really hardcore King James only person, and we'll talk about more, more about that later in, in, in another lecture, but when you get to hardcore King James only people, the King James, the English King James Bible, corrects the Greek and Hebrew. If, if you approach one of them and try to discuss a, a, an issue related to the Greek or the Hebrew text, they'll say, well, the, the King James has superseded them. Jerome's Vulgate for the Roman Catholic Church really becomes the same thing. Now it will take time. Jerome's Vulgate is not immediately and universally accepted. It's gonna take about 50 years after Jerome before his Vulgate really is appreciated for what it is. And, and it is appreciated as a masterful work of Latin literature and, 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 and really becomes the, the guide for Christianity. Um, you're not, you, your sermons are in Latin. The church services are in Latin. What is going to emerge as the mass is done in Latin. Um, everything is done in Latin. Uh, I mean, and this was pervasive in, in the Catholic church. Uh, when I was a kid, I went to a Catholic service and the service was still being done in Latin. Now the Vatic Vatican II Council in 1960-ish uh, had changed that and had said that the, the mass should be done in the vernacular, but there are still a lot of places in Catholic churches where it is done in Latin. Um, it was interesting, the, the, um, the Pope, Pope Benedict, when he announced his resignation a few weeks ago, he made the announcement in Latin and um, newspaper reporters and people were on the scene, they're there for this big you know, uh, announcement and, and the Pope gives his announcement in Latin and they're kind of scratching their heads and not knowing exactly what he just said, but there was actually a reporter, a woman reporter with the Boston Globe who breaks the story because she understands Latin. She understood exactly what he said and she got out and knocked the story out and, and, and kind of scooped everybody uh, because she still, she still understood Latin. She understood Latin and taken it to school or something like that uh, and knew what he had said. So, so Latin is the dominant language. The Catholic Church ultimately will make Jerome's Vulgate inspired. It is, and, and when you understand the work of translating the Bible into vernacular languages, English or French or German or whatever, um, understand that, that when you start tinkering with the Latin Vulgate, if you are a Catholic in this era, you are tinkering with the inspired Word of God. And, and that's how they understood it. And, and again, if you control the language of the, of the Bible, if you control the language, if everything is done in Latin and only you really understand what's going on or the educated understand, I mean, the, the people in the pew, the people in, in, in the church services may or may not have understood any Latin at all. And so it, it, it kind of makes Christianity and the church service a very mystical kind of experience because things are being said in a language you don't understand and you're repeating them 
in, in, in uh, participating in the service. And when you are called upon to say something, you would say something in Latin. You may or may not have any idea what that actually means. And so the, the church controlled society, the Roman Catholic Church, controlled society, controlled the religious services, controlled everything by maintaining a uniform language. And so they were uh, very, very reluctant, uh, if not outwardly hostile, to um, a, a translation of the Bible, putting it in the language of the, uh, uh, that, that people could understand and interact with. Does that make sense? So it, 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 you cannot underestimate the importance of Jerome's Vulgate and its continuing influence in the church, which leads us up to the, this now emerging um, uh, English Bibles that we're going to start getting. The first foray, the first person who's going to challenge that uh, is, is a man named uh, John Wycliffe. Uh, John Wycliffe um, lives from about 1320 to 1331. We really don't know. There's about an 11 year period. We're not sure when he was born. But we do know that he died in 1384. And Wycliffe, who is known as the morning star of the Reformation, uh, he was really an, an early reformer, not unlike uh, Martin Luther. Uh, Wycliffe was uh, challenging the established church on several fronts. And one of the things he does in terms of challenge is he produces a, a Bible. Well, and frankly, he produces the Gospels in English. Now, Wycliffe um, translated Jerome's Vulgate. So it's, it's, to call Wycliffe a, a, an English version of the Bible is inaccurate at several levels. First of all, it is Wycliffe's translation of Latin into English. And, and he does that in uh, about 1382, 1383. He produces several versions, and it's actually quite popular. Um, but the problem is that it, he, his English wasn't very good, frankly. He, he didn't speak, he was a scholar. And so he thought in Latin. He wrote better Latin than he wrote English. Um, and, and that is not going to be uncommon. Uh, when we get to the Bishop's Bible, uh, Archbishop Mash Matthew Parker, who supervises and, and oversees that, was much better in Latin than he was in English. And the Bishop's Bible ultimately suffers from that because it's not a good English. It's, it's not a, and, and Wycliffe's translation from Latin into English is very um, wooden. It's very stiff. It, it doesn't read very well. Um, but it is the first one in English and it's widely popular. Um, but it was a, a significant challenge to the Catholic Church. Wycliffe is ultimately, uh, uh, ultimately dies. Um, to give you an idea of the depth of animosity of the Catholic Church towards English versions or any version of the Bible uh, other than Latin or, or translating the Bible into a vernacular language, uh, the, uh, Wycliffe dies in uh, 1382. Uh, there is a church council held in 1415, the Council of Constance. And in the council, and so we're talking um, 30 years after Wycliffe is dead, uh, dead and buried. Uh, in the Council of Constance, Wycliffe was declared, because of his translation of the Bible into English, uh, Wycliffe was declared to be a heretic, which probably didn't bother Wycliffe too much because he'd already been dead. But uh, to underscore the seriousness by which they took this, 30 years after Wycliffe had died, he was declared a heretic by this church council. Uh, uh, church officials went to where he was buried and dug up his body and placed his remains on a wooden stake and burned them. And then his ashes were scattered into the ocean. 
This was this is how serious this was taken by the church. This was an example to all who might follow that um, this simply would not be tolerated. And after Wycliffe, there, there isn't anything really uh, done or even attempted that we are aware of that, that made any note um, until William Tyndall. And um, William Tyndall, or the Tyndall Bible, is uh, going to come into existence in about 1523, so nearly a hundred years, or a little over a hundred years after the Council of Constance, after Wycliffe has been uh, um, dug up and burned at the stake, uh, um, you have William Tyndall uh, producing his uh, Bible, producing his work. Now, Tyndall is a fascinating character. Um, Tyndall is one of the real stories of the Reformation era. Tyndall, like most other reformers, doesn't start off to reform anything. Uh, Tyndall is, is a uh, Catholic priest. He is, by all accounts, a happy Catholic priest. Um, he was a scholar. He uh, lives, he's born in 1494. He dies in 1536. He was a, uh, um, a, a, a scholar, a, a, a guy who really understood not only Latin, but English. Uh, uh, Tyndall thought in English, which was unusual for scholars of this time. He thought in English, he wrote in English, and he wrote an English that people understood. And he, and he wrote in a manner, uh, in, in terms of English, he wrote in a style and, and a language that, that edu I mean, we're talking about educated people, people who understood the language, not uh, um, the folks who were illiter illiterate and had a limited vocabulary, even if they, they were English by nature, but the, the educated. He, he wrote in a, a popular English that everyone understood. Uh, um, you know, this doesn't happen in English translations, uh, even to this day. I mean, for instance, you, you take the, take the uh, any version you like, take the uh, uh, NASB. The NASB now is, is the Greek and Hebrew are translated by a, a committee. They, they work through that, they're very careful, they're very di diligent, and, and then they create a, a document of a translation from the languages into English and goes to an English style committee. People who are expert in English and they, and they you know, smooth it out and frame it. And, and really what you end up with in any modern English translation is a translation that's very readable, but it's not an English that anyone uses. It's kind of a perfect English. It's, it's really an English that, that um, it, it, like I said, it's very readable, it's very usable, but no one talks that way. No one speaks that way. You wouldn't speak the way the, the uh, NASB writes or even the NIV, you, in, people don't talk that way. Um, it's like when you were in grade school and you were learning how to write cursive and you have, the, you have the, the blank line and then above that you had this very formalized, nice, flowing script of, of letters and you had to copy that. And Well, no one writes like that. Um, no one has a script like that. And, and, and it's the same thing with kind of an any English translation. No one really talks like that or speaks like that or even writes like that because it is so stylized and so perfect um, for, for that, uh, for, you know, to that, to that era of, of English, whatever that might be. So, um, but Tyndall didn't write like that. He, he wrote in a manner that people understood. He wrote in, in English that, that people, uh, was, that, people really used. So that was the, uh, um, the work he did. Now Tyndall um, wanted to work within the system. And, and he got in his mind that, that Christians would be much better off um, in terms of living the Christian life if they could actually understand the Bible and read it and, and begin to apply it to their lives. He was, he was uh, um, 
he was moving forward in that era. And again, one of the things, question always comes up, why didn't Wycliffe's Reformation catch on? I mean, it was, it was popular. It really went forward in many, many respects. But, you know, he, he lives and dies, uh, you know, in the, in the 14th century. And it, why didn't his Reformation take off? Well, one of the answers, of course, is the printing press. Wycliffe and his writings and his Bible uh, aren't widely circulated because every copy had to be produced by hand, which is a, a tediously laborious process. To, to create a manuscript of the Bible like if, if you went to, if you were rich and important enough in the 14th or 15th century and wanted to go get a Bible and, and could hire somebody to produce it, it might take a monk or a team of monks in the monastery who are copying these out by hands, it, it, it might take a year or two. If you, so if you went and ordered it and you had the authority and, and you could pr- get one, it, you say, I'd like one. It might take a year or two to get it because it had to be done by hand. Now, they're often beautiful and elaborate with lots of hand decorations and things, and those would take on, you know, uh, that would take more time. Uh, but at the same time, that was often just the, 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 the scribe's way of relieving the tediousness of writing words by drawing some illustrations to illuminate what we call an illuminated Bible. And so they would do that. Um, so Tyndall's, or I mean not Tyndall, but Wycliffe's material doesn't get widely disseminated because it's simply technologically not possible. So his sermons and his material and his ideas, though not dissimilar to the reformers that would come along two centuries later, he doesn't have the advantage that Martin Luther has and the Reformation then, because Martin Luther can write something out and can write a sermon or write a tract or write 95 theses, and it can go to a printer. And it can be printed and disseminated widely. Now, we look at printing, and and, and if I took you to an old print shop, a printing press, and showed you how they used to do it, where it was, every letter was put into a rack and it was tightened and put down and you would roll ink across and put the paper and press it and, and you'd produce a, a page. You know, we look at that, of course, and say, what in the world? I mean, that's, it take forever to create a book. Well, actually it doesn't. It doesn't take all that long. And compared to writing it out in a manuscript form, it was revolutionary. Gutenberg's printing press, uh, there was an old PBS series called The Day the World Changed. And it really was. With the advent of the printing press, the advent of movable type, was the day the world changed because the uh, uh, information, books, knowledge, uh, propaganda, everything was widely available. I, I was watching a, um, the History Channel um, a documentary on the Revolutionary War. Uh, a couple nights ago, and and one of the great impetuses, and and maybe one of the things that made the Revolutionary War happen and successful, and 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 stirred up enough interest in it, of course, was Thomas Paine's little pamphlet, forty-six page pamphlet called Common Sense, um, which he was able to to get printed and disseminated, and um, when you compare how widely common sense was distributed in the colonies. And if you extrapolate the population of the colonies to the population today and and compare, you know, common sense sold the equivalent of 80 million copies. And and so that's the the idea of of getting information out and and, and publishing it and getting ideas and getting it circulated was, preeminently important from a human point of view to the success of the Protestant Reformation, the success of Luther particularly, um, as opposed to um, the the lack of success of of a Wycliffe. Well, Tyndale also is successful because Tyndale produces a Bible 
and is able to actually print it. They use a printing press. They, they, they begin to produce these things. Uh, one of the Bibles that we're going to have on display is a Tyndall New Testament, which is, is what Tyndall actually was able to produce. Uh, uh, Tyndall's Bible, again, wasn't the entire Bible. It wasn't even the entire New Testament. Uh, he translated uh, at least the Gospels and, and, and a few other books uh, as well. But Tyndall's Bible, his New Testament that he produced, his Gospels, was a small book about, you know, four inches by seven inches. And it was something easily carried. It was easily smuggled, uh, but it was produced on on uh, small printing presses in mass quantities, comparatively speaking, for that time. And he was able to uh, uh, produce and, and get them out. Um, as as Tyndall wanted to produce the Bible in English to help Christianity. He had the best intentions and he went to his ecclesiastical leader, the guy he worked for, who was the Bishop of London. And the Bishop of London, you know, wasn't uh, um, adverse to the idea, but again, and, and he had the authority in his local area to say, yeah, go ahead and do that. But again, he didn't want to uh, um, buck the trend and, 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 and answer to the Pope or answer to anybody else. And so he kind of kept putting Tyndall off and putting Tyndall off and said, yep, that's really a good idea. We need to do that. We need to get on with it. Uh, just give me a little bit more time. You know, let's do this first and this first. And, and he was very, very cautious. And, and Tyndall finally determined that, that he just simply wasn't going to uh, um, ever get any cooperation from the Bishop of London, and so he departed and began to produce the Bible on his own, which made him kind of an outlaw. Um, Fox's, uh, John Fox wrote The Acts and Monuments, which is commonly referred to as Fox's Book of Martyrs, and um, he says this about uh, Tyndall. Master Tyndall happened to be in the company of a learned man and in consuming and disputing with him drove him to that issue that he that the learned man said we were better to be without God's law than the popes. Master Tyndall hearing that answered him said I defy the pope and all his laws and said if God spare my life ere many years I will cause a boy that driveth the plow to know more of the scripture than thou dost. And, and, and that was his goal. He, he, he viewed the Bible as so important that he wanted the Bible immediately available to people. And, and by immediate, if we, we understand that word, to mediate stand, means to stand between. And, and really what happened at that time was the, the, the Pope, the church, the, the ecclesiastical structure mediated Christianity to the people. So in other words, a person could not go, in, in the church's view at that time, a person, individual, could not go straight in, to God, to put it in its simplest terms. They had to go through the church to get to God. You didn't, an individual did not pray, you know, we would commonly pray to Jesus. We would pray to God. We would pray the Holy Spirit. However we would pray, and the church says, you couldn't do that in that era. That would be unthinkable. You prayed to, you confessed to the priest. You gave your request to the priest. You prayed to the priest, who then would pray to God for you, who would absolve you from sins in God's name. And so the, the church mediated everything that way. What Tyndall wanted was immediacy. Remove the mediator, the individual, straight to God in that connection. In other, and, and, the, and the individual Christian straight to the Christian life. And to accomplish that, the Christian needed to understand the scripture. And for Tyndall, it became more important for the individual to be able to read and understand the Bible than it was for the individual to read and understand the, 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 the church, the, the ecclesiastical law, the sermons of the Pope, etc., etc., etc. Does that make sense?
And so what you have going on there is is this guy who's you know getting more and more um, uh, reformed minded. And Tyndall uh, um, began working on his English version in 1522, about as, as far as we can tell. And and the one thing, honestly, that that propelled him to do that was another version of the Bible that had been translated into a vernacular language, and that was Martin Luther. Martin Luther had uh, translated the Bible and Greek and Hebrew, uh, from Greek and Hebrew, into the German language after his, when, when he was, when, when Luther was out hiding from the, uh, uh, the Diet of Worms, from the, the, the council, remember the story that after the Diet of Worms, L Luther is kind of protected by uh, uh, Frederick, and, and Luther goes and hides in a castle for a couple of years, actually grows a beard, and, and is everyone knows he's there, but nobody's strong enough to go and attack this castle and, and attack Frederick to get to Luther. So Luther kind of lives you know, in, in exile, and while he's there, one of the things Luther does, which really angered the church even more than the 95 Theses. You read the 95 Theses and, and they're not, these are not radical, by our imagination, these are not radical concepts. Um, what really uh, kind of propels the church against Luther entirely is the fact he then translates the, the Bible into German. Luther's German Bible. Now we're, we're also, I mean, we're talking about men of genius here. Luther was a guy who understood German, just like Tyndall understood English. He was a scholar, but he spoke the German of the people. He, he really, and he produces a Bible in the German language in, in the early 1500s, 1522, that um, will have a longer life, frankly, than the King James Bible. The, the, the Luther's German Bible will be the standard German Bible really into the 1920s and beyond, when, when German vernacular sort of changes and the grammar begins to change around the turn of the century. But, the, but Luther's German Bible uh, will, will be the standard for nearly, in German anyway, for, for well over 400 years. Um, Tyndall, who like all scholars of the day, read German, uh, and and uh, he saw Luther's German Bible, and that inspired him to provide an English translation using the Greek text. And then he would expand that and and begin to include the Hebrew. Although as he, you know he he never really got to the Old Testament much. He did a little bit there. Um, his Hebrew was adequate, but but certainly not substantial. And he was more important. He was, it was more important to him, honestly, to get the, uh, the Bible in the New Testament into the hands of the people. So he began his uh, work, and he finally produces it uh, about 1523. You see uh, copies uh, beginning to appear with that date. Now, they, they, now he was constantly revising it. Uh, uh, he would be revising his work up to his capture and execution in 1536 um, to escape and to produce the Bible in, in relative safety. Uh, he actually leaves England and moves to the continent and he begins to travel all around, especially in Holland. Holland was a relatively safe location for Protestants, uh, the Catholic Church wasn't terribly strong there, and the Protestant Reformation had really taken hold. So Luther kind of, or I mean, uh, Tyndall kind of wanders around, and and he even is in um, uh, Wittenberg for a time. And interestingly enough, um, Henry the Eighth, we talked about him last week. Henry the Eighth was annoyed by Tyndall. Um, but what really enraged him finally and, and, and set Henry VIII in search of Tyndall to stop him was 
he's being told all of the places because he's really annoyed that it, that his people can't seem to find Tyndale. And and Henry VIII says, well, what is is Tyndale? Does he does he have a printing press strapped to the back of a donkey or something? I mean, how come we can't find him? And they begin to recite all of the places. Well, we know he's been here, and we know he's been here, and we know he's been here. And they finally says, and, and we know he, you know, we know he's been in Wittenberg, and and then they're just a list. Well, Henry the Eighth, Wittenberg. Well, is 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 Tyndall a Lutheran? Is is he a follower of Martin Luther? And and the the answer is probably so. We you know he's we seems to be there was no evidence to connect and there's no evidence that, that Luther and Tyndall ev- ever even met. Um, or, but that's remember Henry now the Henry the Eighth is still Catholic. He has written the defense of the seven sacraments. He is the defender of the faith. He is still aligned with the Catholic Church, and he is still very much opposed to Martin Luther. Um, so when he begins to make this connection that Tyndale is in league with Luther, um, then he really begins to get serious about finding uh, William Tyndale. Um, Henry the Eighth. Um, sends uh, agents to locate and arrest him. He begins to send people all over, wherever Tyndall might be, he sends people looking for him. Um, Tyndall had had also now um, written some other things, uh, one of which was uh, um, called The Practice of Prelates. And in the practice of prelates, Tyndale made the unfortunate uh, choice to attack Henry VIII's various marriages. And, and, and his divorces. And um, this pretty much uh, um, irritated Henry even more. But it, Henry VIII had ordered Tyndale to be arrested and brought to him. Um, he was the monarch. He was the Tyndale was still an English subject. He was a, a he was an Englishman. He was answerable to the king, not to the Pope not to the church. Because by, by this time now, as, as they're trying to find Tyndale, the split is already well underway. Tyndale was uh, an Englishman. He was to be brought to Henry. Henry was to render judgment. Um, Tyndale was uh, betrayed by a friend in Antwerp in uh, 1535 and he um, is then put on trial and he's executed by uh, first he was strangled to death and then he was burned at the stake famously his uh, his dying expression as he's being burned on the stake was Lord open the eyes of the King of England And um, at a certain level, Henry VIII's eyes were opened. Uh, he, bege- he, he completes the Reformation. He, he does officially break with the Catholic Church. Um, one can argue whether or not uh, Henry's motives were political, which they really were. But he understood the theology. He understood what was going on with it. Um, but it was the nationalism of, of Henry that we talked about last week that re- is really what's going on here. And um, Henry VIII was infuriated by Tyndall's execution. He was uh, clearly unhappy and he, and he made that point very, very clear to his people. There were some people who, were, um, who suffered Henry's wrath because uh, Tyndall had been allowed to be executed uh, by 
the uh, uh, um, the church authorities that that the, the those who betrayed Tyndall uh, turned him over to. So he was uh, um, he wasn't happy. The, the question is, frankly, and, and it's speculation. We we will never know. Uh, had Tyndall been arrested and brought to Henry in that time frame, with Henry changing with the relationship of England to the church, with the dissolution of the monasteries, with the, the uh, um, um, neutering, as it were, of the Catholic Church within England and, and the separation, you know, the question is, would Tyndall have actually, would, would Henry have executed Tyndall? And, and there's a good case to be made that he may not have. He may not have been real happy, um, but 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 by this time, um, uh, Henry might have been more annoyed by uh, um, Tyndall's denouncing his divorces than he would have been annoyed by the translation of the Bible into English. Because again, Henry himself, remember, is going to order a translation of the Bible to be created in English. That's going to ultimately that will be the Great Bible. Um, it doesn't get done until you know Henry is you know close to the end of his life, and and it takes forever and a day. But Henry will actually authorize or allow um, the Coverdale Bible, the My, uh, produced by Miles Coverdale, to be used in in the church and as well as the Matthews Bible. He'll, he will allow it to be used. He, will, he, he needs an English version and um, to use in the church to kind of solidify what he's trying to do in the church. And since the Great Bible is taking so long to get to, he'll use uh, um, what's available to him, which was uh, Coverdale and uh, the, the, the Matthews Bible or the, the Bible, Matthews Bible or the Bible of John Rogers that we'll look at in a couple of weeks. Does that make sense so far? Any questions? Go ahead. It was, um, so it was the Roman Catholic Church that was specifically responsible for the execution of William Tyndale. Yes, okay. the the church authorities. Yeah, uh, Tyndale. And the question is, is you know, who is ultimately responsible for Tyndale's death? And it was really the Catholic Church because Tyndale had been um, Henry's agents were looking for him, and but he was betrayed. Uh, Tyndale was betrayed by a friend to the authorities who kind of picked him up and, and the, the, the Catholic Church hierarchy and, and those people took, uh, took charge. And he was not, they didn't allow him to be taken to Henry. And, and Henry's agents um, kind of went along with it and Henry was, was none too pleased. Good, anything else? Okay, a little bit about Tyndall's Bible and then we'll wrap it up for the day. Um, we talked about last week uh, Tyndall's Bible, Tyndall's English. Uh, the English of William Tyndall, again, is the beginnings of what would be Elizabethan English. Now, it's kind of anachronistic to talk about Tyndall writing in Elizabethan English because he predates Elizabeth, but the English language of Henry VIII, which is late Middle English, is, is already changing. And, and so Tyndall is, uh, is writing in, in an English that, that, that is in really going to be in transition. We talked about that last time that um, the span of those 90 years from William Tyndall in 1523 to the King James Version of 1611 is a, a complete overturning of the English language. Um, you're gonna go from late Middle English, you're gonna blow through Elizabethan English entirely and then and end up in 1611 in, in what we might call early modern English. So the whole, I mean, the English language is, is you know, under reconstruction at this time. And it's, um, word meanings are changing. Um, English is very, very dynamic. Um, this also leads Tyndall, and he's all, uh, Tyndall was a, a tinkerer. Um, Tyndall was one of those guys, he constantly was revising his, his work. He was constantly changing it. it. It goes through many, many different editions all the way up to his death. And, and um, 
which is good in a way. I mean, he was always trying to improve it, but it was bad because he never got to anything else. In other words, he, he didn't get to the whole New Testament. He really didn't get to the Old Testament. And so he never actually produces an entire Bible um, because he's constantly, especially in the Gospels, just constantly tinkering with it and, and reproducing. And it, the printed edition of the Gospels is what is, is most known for. Uh, the, the, the copy that we're going to have here is a uh, 1550 printing of Tyndall's New Testament with the introduction. That, that he writes uh, the, the introduction to the Christian uh, um, reader uh, that, that he puts there, which is very, very uh, interesting to be read. Um, Tyndale is, um, not only translates into English, um, but he translates words differently than what, what had normally been accepted. Yeah, um, the the four that are that are the most notable is um, he translates the uh, uh, where, where the the Latin Vulgate translates church. Um, Tyndale instead of translating the Greek into the word church, he translates it congregation. So. Uh, um, in, instead of even in in our like an NASB where it says you know Paul to the churches in uh, the, the the church at Philippi or the church at Ephesus or the church of whatever uh, Tyndall says to the congregations and, and this is a big deal this is not a minor little you know wording because this is this is an idea that it is not the church which is viewed as the, the, the universal church, the, 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 what we call the Roman Catholic Church, although they, they didn't really refer to themselves as such. Um, the, 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 the organization, the institution, the structure, there's lots of baggage in that word church. And Tyndall is saying, no, it's not that, it's the congregation, it's the local assembly. The individual assembly, the individual locale, the, indi the what we would call in, in the modern term, the local church was, was what was key for Tyndall. And he translated the New Testament to reflect that view. Where frankly, we, would, we won't have a problem now in translating uh, uh, ecclesia as, as church because the baggage isn't the same for us we under when we say church now, we we understand typically a local congregation. When you said church in 1523, you were talking about a structure, about a hierarchy. It's it's a different mindset entirely. Um, so that was a big change. Um, he also translated. Um, he changed the translation in the New Testament from priest to elder. Uh, the the, the uh, uh, Presbyteros he, he translates as elder and, and where it had been translated by Jerome and subsequent Latin translations as priest. Um, one of the things, one of the offices that, that disappears between the time of the early, by the, by, by the, by the second century, the church hierarchy was beginning to develop and, and you really have the elimination of the office of elder. It becomes a very secondary role. Deacons become more important than elders in local assemblies in the early church. Um, the, the, the role of the elders and, and, uh, begin to disappear as the, as the change from the apostolic age to the post-apostolic age. Because that was always the question. Who's, as the apostles die, who takes their place? And that was the huge question. You, read, you remember your church history. That was the huge question that, in many respects, the early church got wrong. Because was someone supposed to take the apostles' place? And, and, and the early church said, yeah. And, and so we have an apostolic succession. And we blame that, you know, you say, well, the, the Pope, the Catholic Church and the, the Pope of, the Pope who is simply, the, the, the main title of the Pope is the Bishop of Rome. B besides becoming Pope, you are the Bishop of Rome. And you, tra you follow that all the way back. And so when, 
when Peter and when Peter dies, who replaces Peter? Well, there's there's someone who becomes the next bishop of Rome, and so on, and eventually the bishop of Rome becomes the pope, and and beyond the scope of what we have to do as to why that happens, but um, the early church decided that the apostles needed to be replaced. There needed to be a bishop. There needed to be a, le- a bishop of a city, a bishop over this group of, of churches. And so the, the elders, uh, uh, in terms of a local group of elders and a local assembly, that office really begins to decline. And, and by the third century, it's essentially gone. Um, the, Pres- the, the, the Protestant Reformation is going to bring that back, especially under Calvin. Um, but he translates, uh, Tyndall translates the word as elder, which is a, a, a significant uh, change in wording. Uh, although I think his first edition, he translates the word, se- he, he translated it in the, into the English word senior, but in subsequent, uh, in, in subsequent trans, uh, works, he translates it elder. That's a really, so that's really important. Um, the most controversial change that he has in his translation is he um, translates the Greek word that we would translate uh, uh, um, repentance or to repent, he translates it to repent. Uh, it had been translated by Jerome and translated by the church in Latin as do penance which obviously doesn't have anything to do with that particular Greek word. Um, it is a theological reading of that word. And so he removes the idea of penance and, and, and changes it to repent. This is the most controversial change. It is the change in translation that firmly puts Tyndall into the Protestant Reformation. It's one of the, and, and Luther does the same thing. He translates it to the, the German version, whatever the, the German word for repent is what he translates uh, the New Testament words for. Do penance changes to repent? It, it, it's enormously powerful. Because now you have English people reading Tyndall's Bible and where they were, they had always been told to do penance to do works, to do things to merit the forgiveness of their sin, now they're being told when they read the Bible to repent. So when, when you know, you come to the passage in the Gospels where, remember John the Baptist says what? He says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The Latin, the, the translation that the church was giving out when the church had come to that, the, John the Baptist was saying, do penance. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Two, I mean, which are two entirely different concepts. Uh, the other key thing is he changes. He changes the the, uh, the word love. Any of the any of the various versions, various words for love, um, were, uh, were translated in the uh, uh, Latin as charity. And he changed the word charity to the actual word love. And again. It's, it's important because of the nuance involved. Charity is a good thing, but, it, but charity involves what? Works. It is, remember, Catholicism, Christianity by this time, Christianity in the Middle Ages was a religion of works. There were things you had to do as opposed to uh, uh, grace and justification by faith. And so, the, the, the Reformation begins to take hold not only because it can be printed and, and the idea is widely disseminated, but because the very foundations, the very theological foundations of the Catholic Church, the dominant church of the time, were being undermined by the translation of the Bible into the vernacular languages and translating them in a style that reflected actual meaning. In other words, you take a language, you take a word in one language and you put it into the appropriate 
word in the, in the target language. Tyndall was after an exact equivalence or a formal equivalence in terms of a translation style as opposed to a, a um, dynamic or a theological equivalence. Now the interesting thing was Jerome's Vulgate was a, was a, was a formal equivalent was an exact, you know, trying to get Greek and Hebrew exactly into Latin. And the, 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 the things had changed over the centuries after Jerome. Um, the, Tyndall was trying for an exact equivalence. Now, in the English translations, it didn't always work out that way. Sometimes, even the reformers, even the, 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 um, the, the uh, translators of the King James, the translators in different eras, um, would come to certain words and they refused to put them in an exact equivalence. Can you think of one? We got a brand new English word because the, the translators didn't know what to do. Slave. Yeah. Baptizo. They, they, baptizo is just transliterated into English, baptize. Um, baptize as a word, it wasn't an English, it didn't mean it, it had a French origination, but it was, what do we do with this word? Because if we translate it exactly, what do we end up with? How do we translate baptizo? To, to immerse, to dip. Um, and the church, obviously, even the reformers, even Calvin, Luther, they, they weren't interested in baptism by immersion. Uh, they were not interested in, um, in that concept. And so even the reformers would theologically tinker with the translation. Because, okay, we want to hold up and, and translate exactly into our languages and, and, and let the people understand what the Bible really says, but you know, even we have limits. And so we're gonna hold back and we're just, and we don't wanna, you know, we can't translate this word sprinkle, everyone will see through that. We don't want to, you know, go that far, so we'll just say baptizo. We'll just make up a word. We'll just transliterate it and we'll just kind of, you know, to use the modern expression, we'll just punt. And that's really what they end up doing with it. Um, because everyone everyone understood, I mean, Calvin understood the word baptizo to mean immerse. And, and, and when you read the Institutes, you come to that section in the Calvin's Institutes on baptism, he talks about this is what the word meant, and, and he said immersion was obviously what the early church practiced, but we don't do that anymore. And And, it, it follows, and there's a long, we could, we could talk a lot about uh, baptism and things like that, but it's kind of beyond where we're going. But, but Tyndale and Tyndale's Bible starts a snowball rolling down a hill, to use, to, to use an illustration, and, and, and it's simply not going to stop for 90 years. Tyndale starts something and, and he, he opens a window to the English people to see the Bible in English, to understand the scripture and, and to do that. And, and his goal that even a plowboy would understand the Bible and be able to read it is, is what he sets in motion. And by 1611, it's gonna become largely a reality. Um, in a, in a 90-year span. Now, Tyndall obviously doesn't live to see it. He's captured, he's executed, he's burned at the stake. Um, but he really gets things started, and, and his English is going to be largely replicated in the King James. It's updated, obviously, to a modern English, but his style, his flow, the lyrical nature of the way he wrote in English is gonna be replicated uh, even into the King James Bible. His, his impact um, on this entire process cannot be understated. Uh, his 
Reformation and his version into English will succeed, whereas Wycliffe, you know, failed and 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 Wycliffe becomes more inspirational than than a, a contributor. His his translation of the English uh, from Latin into English, there, there's no record that it's even consulted by Tyndale or any of the English uh, um, translators that would follow him. So next week, we're going to go from Tyndale and we're going to look at two of Tyndale's disciples, two guys that worked with him. Um, the first one was Miles Coverdale. And, and Miles Coverdale was no less ardent than Tyndale about getting the Bible into English, but Miles Coverdale was a lot more politically astute. He, he, the one thing you can say about Miles Coverdale is he knew how to stay alive. And, and, uh, uh, and he was kind of Tyndale's opposite in that uh, Tyndale knew how to get himself in trouble and get killed. Uh, Coverdale lives in the same era uh, um, Coverdale is born in 1488, dies in 1569. Um, so he's only, he, he's actually older than Tyndale and lives longer than Tyndale. So he's at the same time, same circumstances. He's in England. He wants to get the Bible into English too. Coverdale stays alive. Uh, and Tyndall didn't, and and there's and there's a reason, and there might be some things to learn from that as we look, and then we'll look at the um, Matthew's Bible, which was actually a pr product of another man of that era who managed to stay alive by the name of John Rogers. Uh, he just used the name Matthews because he was kind of he wanted to stay alive, and so he you know kind of changed his name to protect his identity. So we'll take a look at that. Uh, we'll take a look at those two next week.